I don't even know what to say when you come here now, because, anyways, welcome home um, <laughs> to the panel show, your second home. Um, you are going to be one of the major reasons why I stop reading comments on our videos. You have hijacked our platform. Uh, your fans on the platform shout at me all the time. <laughs> Let Rutendo speak. In other times when people accuse me of being a sellout, you should listen more to Rutendo. Hey. But anyways, welcome home, bro. How are you? I'm good, brother. And uh, happy new year. And happy new happy, year to the team. Happy new Gregorian calendar year. Because yes. then people are like, but you said African New Year is in September. <laughs> happy Gregorian calendar new year to the Africans. Your new year was in September. Right, right. Are you good? I'm good, brother. brother you went home? You? No, I didn't. You went in South Africa? I was in SA. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, remember, good holiday. Remember, um, at home, I've also got some enemies as well. Eh? <laughs> People that don't want progress. People that do not want us to succeed on this issue of sanctions. Okay. Because they yeah. benefit from oh, yes. the current chaos. Of course. I okay. mean, they're, they're people that have built serious monopolies. Sure. And if we remove these sanctions, these guys feel like um, it's going to affect and dent their bottom line. Yeah. So some death threats have come around. So Are you serious? I just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So those, those people are going to be watching this platform and... I need them to hear me at least. People like myself and Rutendo, first and foremost, are teachers. We're teachers. And almost all the information we discuss here is not conspiracy theory hidden from. It's stuff that is freely available if you read, if you research, if you speak to people in positions. Number three, for the people that are really greedy capitalists, I guess, if we can build a better Zimbabwe, South Africa, your great great grandchildren will get to live in a better world. They may not be as wealthy as you'd want, but the problem is that if you hoard all the money, your kids will be dollar trillionaires, but there'll be no markets, there'll be no employees, there'll be no work, there'll be nothing. So you part of what we want is to just share some of the wealth so that you guys can keep making money. So we're not trying to destroy anyone. If we really wanted to upset certain spaces, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. We'd take up arms and do the things that other people do. We'd be backdoor. But we are literally trying to educate and empower people so that they can live better, so that Africa can stop being this fucking dark hole that was created by people that benefit from it being a dark hole. And if you're one of them, especially if you're a black African, we understand you want to make money, but for you to even be where you are to make money as a black African, some people had to do what we're doing now. 100%. So let's just, anyways, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing about what you're saying is that, um, we just saying, let the wealth flow to everybody, Sure. particularly the poor. Sure. Because when you consolidate wealth in the hands of a few people and everybody else doesn't have. You're simply going to make the people at the bottom envious mm. and they're going to want to drop you from the top. And then you have a situation like we saw in Libya. Mm. And a lot of people always say that the imperialists came in and they removed Gaddafi, they mm. killed Gaddafi and they killed Saddam. But many people don't ask themselves, were Saddam and uh, Gaddafi taking care of enough people mm. to ensure that there wouldn't be a mass uprising? Mm. The fact that there were rebels in Libya and those rebels ended up looking for weapons from other countries. Mm. And the same with Saddam. Tells me that they isolated enough people to allow a force to rise up against yeah. them. That's and always this is what, And we don't want that in Zimbabwe. And we are saying to the people that are putting these death threats on me, these people that don't want these sanctions to go away, that at the end of the day, you're actually endangering the same system that you want to protect mm by isolating everybody else, making sure there's, there's enough hungry people mm. who are going to eventually want to rise up and say, you know what, let's break this thing apart, let's destroy this thing, and let's start afresh. Mm. We're not their enemy, they are. If I'm anything, upset. we're helping uplift some of the poor so that they don't become a threat yeah, to them one day. It's, it's common Some sense. capitalists just don't <laughs> get it. It's common Let sense. some of the people eat. You are, you are McDonald's. If you take all the money, you have no customers. 
And once the customers are angry, they're going to create their quota business 100%. and your McDonald's is going to collapse. We've got a guy called uh, Hope Hoching on in Zimbabwe. Mm. Uh, he's a very influential person on social media. What's his name? Uh, Chimono. Chimono. Yeah. And the mm. Americans have decided to I use know Hope him. Well. They've reached out to him and they're using his voice. Mm. They give him awards. And every time he gets an award, he gets money that goes with that award. Mm. The issue that I have is that Hopewell was actually pro-Zimbabwe. Mm. But he was disappointed. Sure. By the system. And he felt exactly what we're talking about, that there's a few people who want to keep making money at the expense of everybody else. Mm. And then he decided to turn. Mm. Now, he's a sellout in my books. Okay. But he would probably tell you that I'm not a sellout but I'm not going to support a system that just protects a few people to get enrich themselves at the expense of everybody else. I'd rather we break down the system. And that is what we need to avoid, to have much more talented people, people like Hopewell, turning against the country just because they feel mm. better about a few people who are eating alone and keeping talent and other people who actually want to lift the country mm. out. How do, you, how do you balance that? Because I know you've criticized me. I have issues with the ANC. I bash the leadership. Um, and you keep trying to rein me in. And when you rein me in, I've seen some of the comments saying, when are you a ZANU PF, uh, mouthpiece, etc." And I understand you. You are pro-Zimbabwe. You are saying, protect the nation, protect the people. Yes, we can try and sort out certain bad people, etc., which could be a similar argument in the ANC. How do you balance... Pen, let's say, being used by an America to be a mouthpiece against the ANC, but almost in a destructive manner for the, the rest of the nation. Because in my head, I'm like, but if I don't bash the ANC, if I don't take this funding from America to try and get rid of the ANC, it's not going to change. But you can see through that and you're like, you might think you're doing the right thing, but the Americans, Europeans, Asians, as an example, they don't actually care. They want dysfunction because that's how they make. <laughs> how do you balance that anger while preserving the beauty of your nation and protecting its people? I think um, it is. Um, I was listening to Andy Lemnitama the other day, and he brought up a very interesting concept that was brought up by uh, Mao Zedong. And he says you need to understand what is the fundamental struggle, and then what is the petty struggle. Mm. The fundamental struggle is the struggle that determines your existence and your survival. Mm. And the fundamental struggle that we have as Africans for our own survival is an antagonistic competition with other races. Okay. We are living in a world where there's a competition for resources. And in this competition for resources, teams have been formed. Mm. And in these teams that have been formed, most of the teams that we're playing against are actually playing as groups of races against us. Yeah. The Jews have established themselves as a race and a people that are separate. They don't mix with others. Mm. They've created themselves as a group that is that that seeks to make sure that other races are fighting each other, but seeks to control the one that is dominant at the end of the day. The Europeans have set themselves apart in the same way. The Aryans have set themselves apart in the same way. The Indians and the Chinese well, the are beginning. The Germans. <clears throat> when you look at, they, they, they actually say that the, 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 the Germans are not uh, Aryan. Okay. They called themselves Aryan, but when you read the book by Lodrop Stadert, he actually considered them as what were called the Alpines. Okay. So the Alpines are not necessarily Aryan, according to the pecking order that was spelt out by this eugenicist called Lodrup Standard. He says that we have the Alpine, uh, we have the Nordics, mm. okay, as the first race of Europeans and the best. The Alphas. Of the, the Alphas. The Vikings. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then he says, then we have the next layer, which is called the Alpines. Mm. And then we've got the Mediterraneans. Okay. Which are then the Spanish, the Portuguese, the, the dark, ones that the darker ones, the ones that mix with black people, ah. <laughs> and apparently they have now uh, dumbed down their genetics yeah. because of mixing blood. Now, what Lodrop says is that the Aryan race is the Nordics, okay. not the Alpine. So the Germans, according to him, Hitler was misdiagnosing or misnom. It was a misnomer to mm. call Germans uh, uh, Aryan. Thank you. That's why I found that very interesting. So they know who they are. They know who they are. So called. you were speaking about how they've, these, They're groups, competing as these groups. groups are organized and they and need other groups to not be functioning. And they understand 
that it is the resources of this world and the control of those resources mm. and the sophistication of those resources and processing of those resources to create something of value that you can sell back to markets with the greatest markets being in Asia and Africa and the cheapest resources being in Africa. They understand the need to subjugate mm to keep down all the other races for them to have control and dominance. Mm. And then the Jews at the top are saying, we don't care about who is who. We simply want to control the power of the one that is dominant. Mm. We want to control the banking system. Mm. We want to control the monetary system, the payment systems, mm. so that we can control the country that controls all the resources and we have the ultimate power. African hasn't realized that this is what this is about. So it's still individualism. This is why you have the problem we're talking about, where one person wants to be a billionaire at the expense of all other own. Africans, and while they're doing that, they forget the collective. Mm. They do not sit with the collective. They don't build capacity to defend themselves with the collective. So at the end of the day, they get isolated, they get beaten in this group mm. sport. And you saw it even in the World Cup. Ronaldo is used to playing alone sure. as a lone star. Sure. He doesn't give others a chance to create the opportunities for him to actually defend the ball with him. He wants to only always have the ball to score on his own. In his defense, and that way, Portugal never does for well. the Cristiano Ronaldo <laughs> is goat fans come at us. In his defense, I, I agree with you. I think he's improved a lot over time, especially when he started wearing the captain's armband. I saw that he... He's gone better. He's, yeah. he's become a much better team player. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. Before the Cristiano is GOAT fans come at us, <laughs> even though we know Messi is now the GOAT, and, and, and now Messi, you can come at and us. And Messi did it well. Mm. You saw how he, they played soccer as the Argentinians. It's a team. It's a team sport. It's, it's why they struggled with past World, World Cups, because he was trying to be a star and he realized, 100%. I actually cannot do this thing alone. And this is the problem with Africa. We want to be stars as individuals and not as a team. And mm. we're losing that team sport. Mm. And this is where the African has to understand that it is time for him to play as a team with others mm. in order for it to... So your question was, so when do you decide? Where is the balance? The mm. balance is in making sure when we fight the fundamental war, yes. we are playing as a team against other teams so that we win secure control of our resources, mm -hmm. secure our ability to defend ourselves and to create wealth so that at the end of the day, we can be able to win in this race of the world. When we've got problems inside the team, we must not make that the match. We must not make that the issue mm -hmm. where we begin to fight each other much more than we're fighting the enemy. I hear you. And this is what's happening in the ANC. They're fighting each other, this petty war between themselves mm -hmm. so that a few individuals can eat, so that Ronaldo can score the goal on his own, forgetting that they have to be a team to score against the enemy and to win against the enemy. To the extent that right now, some of the people within the ANC are playing with the opposite team, scoring own goals. True. You know what I mean? Shout out to Pia Issa. <laughs> Shout out to Pia Issa. <laughs> oh, shit, sorry. Please carry on. You guys so, can go, wow, well, my so 2000 can go and look up who that is. So this is where the balance is. So I've got I've got fundamental issues with my, my government. Mm. I've got fundamental issues with ZANO-PF. Mm. I've got fundamental issues with the opposition. But I choose to stick with the team. To focus the, on, the, on it, the fundamental struggle. On the fundamental struggle and not the petty struggle. And for this reason, you, you still say, I or we as black South Africans should keep voting for the ANC? Yes. I, I don't think we have got an option. And I say we because I, I, can, I can also vote here. Really? Yes. Why? <laughs> because I am a, I'm, I'm a thingy of Are South Africa. Are you a South African yeah, I've citizen got an ID. resident? I've got an ID. Okay. So I can vote. Can you vote in both countries? Yes. It was fucking unfair. <laughs> Nangakwa, come sort out your boy. Jeez. So, so for me... You and vote I, in both countries? Mm, I vote in, in both countries. But so I, need, for, I need dual citizenship. That's what I need in my life. For me, what, what, what I believe is that there is no option but to vote for the ANC. Why not another black party? There's no black party within half mass that if you moved 
your vote from the ANC, you wouldn't split and fragment the vote in such a way that it ends up with too many black parties who can then be co-opted by white capital to then vote for the DA, which is what's already happening in the metros. You've seen the uh, C, uh, the, the EFF voting with the DA, mm. allowing the DA to run very strategic met metropolitans. Mm. And that's wrong. And like I said, that the moment you give the DA this time power mm. to run the country, that's a different ballgame. Because that's what they've been fighting for ever since apartheid ended. And the DA, in a matter of speaking, is basically the NP. It is the national party behind the DA. But the I've ideology. heard the national party join the ANC. Oh, no. If you listen to Herman Mashaba, Herman Mashaba had a, had, a, had, a, had, a, had a thing, a talk that he was giving. And he was saying, when I was in the DA, I actually believed that it was non-racial. I actually believed that they were a democratic party. Mm -hmm. And I believed that they could bring change. But when he said he, when he got inside, he actually realized that the ideology and influence of the DA was very predominantly national party. I was surprised to hear Herman say mm -hmm. something like that. But that is very instrumental and insightful to understand who is behind the DA. And so if it is the National Party behind the DA, if it is the spirit of the apartheid order and the apartheid system and the apartheid capital system that still exists, mm -hmm. then that means that voting for the DA, allowing them into a coalition, will simply give power to white monopoly capital, its media, which is very much still an apartheid system, to restore apartheid in South Africa with a democratic mandate. And that's the biggest threat to black South Africans and Africa in general. So a lot of people would say, why do I care? Mm -hmm. I care because, remember, Zimbabwe, for it to be in the position that it is in today, mm -hmm. be it the destruction that happened to the country during the apartheid destabilization period, be it the big loans and debts, which is 60% of our loans and debts that we have in Zimbabwe today mm -hmm. were because of fighting against apartheid, the destabilization, the sanctions they imposed on Zimbabwe, mm. and the wars that we had to fight against the apartheid South African government. I know that they used their apartheid companies to destabilize economically. And even now, the apartheid companies continue to dominate Southern Africa mm. and the African region. The banks of South Africa dominate the region. The telecommunications companies dominate the regions. The mercenaries that come from the system, from the apartheid system, dominate the continent. Mm. And if we allow a DA to come back, it's simply going to exacerbate the destruction that was done during the fight against apartheid today so that they maintain dominance over not only black South Africans, but the entire Southern African region and the entire African region. And what they're doing is a mandate that was written for them by Henry Kissinger in 1963 in a document called NSSM 39 that said that black people cannot be allowed to control Southern Africa because it is the Persian Gulf of strategic mineral resources. Lithium platinum, nickel, chrome. We're now looking at uh, 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 the PGMs, uh, uh, platinum, platinum group metals, mm. gold, right? Mm. And now we've got the green minerals, the coltans that you found in, uh, find in Congo. Mm. They need to continue controlling that if they're going to maintain their strategic dominance. I think generally we can agree that the ANC hasn't done a great job and to what you're saying, apartheid companies and banks, etc., are still dominating in the southern, in southern Africa. In Africa, your argument is simply as woeful as the ANC is. As much as some of them help the enemy and score own goals, it's still better than allowing a DA or a fragmentation of the black vote. Because the fragmentation they're making a bad thing, but it's. In their fumbling around, it, it's still we're still slightly better off. We and and for me, where the ANC are convertible, the ANC can be convinced to do the right things by who? By the people. By, by the people. How? Like what you're doing now. One, by the pressure that the people are giving them to say, "We're tired of you. Mm. You haven't delivered for us." That pressure works. People have been saying that, but nothing's changing. It's actually getting worse. They're getting more arrogant. I don't. I don't know. You but, don't know if they're getting more arrogant. <laughs> no, I, I don't. Their, I don't. I don't know if they're getting more. Hey, the arrogant. The faces my, I see when I think of the ANC. Ah, uh, one day I'm probably gonna have to sit with this guy. My issue. Mbalula. My issue comes. 
but 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 you see with Balula, I I I get mixed feelings. I get mixed feelings even for Ciro Ramaphosa. I think Ciro Ramaphosa has become the problem within the ANC in the aspect that he brought the capitalist neoliberal system right at the doorstep and leadership of the ANC. So he's almost doing DA work is what you're saying? Almost doing DA work. But having said that, but I have to contradict work. myself, Okay. which is what I was about to say about Balula. So you've got this leader who is a neoliberal, mm -hmm. very committed to the white project, mm -hmm. And in so trying to be a capitalist, he so helps the white people that created him, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he's the president that stood up to speak against Zimbabwean sanctions because if Zimbabwe is not okay, the SADC region is not okay, then we cannot prosper economically as capitalists within the region. So I am forced to also stand with him there. Mm -hmm. I'm also forced to stand with Fikil Mbalula who said that, listen, we are not going to brook regime change in Zimbabwe. Because of economic sanctions that are being used to punish the Zimbabwean people, so that when Zimbabweans go for elections, they elect a puppet government, which is the opposition of Zimbabwe. Fikil Mbalula is the only Secretary General of the ANC that is categorically called the opposition of Zimbabwe a puppet government, mm. and also said that they will not support regime change and the replacement of ZANU PF with that. Now, if you understand those two positions, they're very opposed from the neoliberal position. ANC, if it stands on the neoliberal position, which is where we've always suspected that it stands with Ciro Ramaphosa, cannot be saying that we don't want ZANU-PF to go because the neoliberal outlook is that ZANU-PF must go. But don't you think that's just politicians politicking and maybe a Cyril and a, F a Figile through, for their handlers or for themselves have just found a way to benefit from a ZANU-PF Zim and from speaking about sanctions. Maybe they've, let's say, even if Cyril went to England to meet with King Charles, he said, Listen, my mate, Charles, I'm going to say this thing because it's good on the ground. I will return, you are going to defend me on platforms, but we'll keep plundering. Don't you worry. Don't you think it's just politicians politicking to win, <laughs> to win your, your heart? Meanwhile, the reality on the ground is nothing really is changing. I'll be honest with you. When I started uh, the anti-sanctions movement, yeah. 2017, 2018, it was at a time where ZANU-PF was becoming unpalatable mm -hmm. and unpopular sure. among the politicians and governments in the SADC region. And the SADC countries were beginning to vocalize it quite uh, uh, openly, mm -hmm. that ZANU-PF is becoming a hindrance in the region. Mm -hmm. So there was a narrative that ZANU-PF is a hindrance in the region because it is misgoverning, it is abusing its people, mm. and we need now to do something to make Zimbabwe what it used to be yeah. by removing the ZANU-PF government. And that narrative was being pushed by Botswana, it was beginning to be pushed by South Africa, mm. and it was beginning to be pushed by Zambia when the new president came in. Mm. So, it works for the neoliberal agenda for, 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 for Ramaphosa mm. and the Secretary General of the ANC to continue with that narrative because it gets them the support from the West. Okay. But they didn't do that. They did not continue with that narrative. In fact, we hear that there was a document that was written that began to say within the ANC that the ANC has got to support other liberation movements. Mm. Otherwise, if they don't, the removal of the last and probably the most powerful liberation movement, ZANU-PF in Zimbabwe, will actually be a harbinger to the removal of the ANC in South Africa. And if you look at the ESCOM crisis we have today, mm. ANC have began to realize that the ESCOM crisis and the uh, when we saw uh, future growth, which is an old mutual company, mm. refusing to give loans to SOEs in South Africa, to state-owned enterprises in South Africa. And it actually went and campaigned to talk to other members of the ISS, uh, ISISA uh, group, which is a group of lenders and a group of uh, 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 global funders Financial across. Yes, they went to lobby them not to give money as well to South African state-owned enterprises in 2017. Mm. That is something that the ANC has begun to realize and understand that number one, 
it started exacerbating the, the, the problem in uh, 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 um, Transnet. Mm -hmm. It started exacerbating the problem within S SAA, and it started exacerbating the problems within ESCOM, which is why we're in the crisis that we're in. And so ANC have began to realize that, oh my God, these are sanctions. We were put under sanctions by the financial system. Knowing that we've got a very strong state-owned economy, mm. especially in the parastatals and SOEs, and they realized they were being hit there, denied money, denied loans, they recognized that they're being sabotaged for regime change in 2024. It's 2017 we, was when Zuma was in power. Zuma was in power. And, and when Ciro came in, and when Ciro came in, nothing changed. I'm trying to figure out, you speak about an old mutual whose chairperson was Trevor Manuel. Yes. Who now says he's no longer ANC. And remember, Trevor Manuel was at uh, uh, Old Mutual. While that was happening, he also had a relationship with Rothschild. Mm. And Rothschild began to have a bigger vocal uh, 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 issue with how South Africa was being run. And they are part and parcel of part of this uh, ASA, A -A -S -I -S -A. Um, and the international ASI, ASISA as well. Trevor Manuel was comfortable with getting old mutual to almost go against his ANC with the Zuma in power and lobby other people. 100%. And then now they're changing their tune because Cyril is in power. Uh -huh. That's what it sounds are, like to me. They didn't change their tune. That's the problem. It's still the same And today. I feel... Because I, I know feel. Trevor Manuel was on Cyril's board when they were going to chase money with Otit or... He was on that... Whatever that committee thing was of trying to bring in foreign direct investment. So we were trying to get to reconcile the two opposing positions that yeah. Cyril has taken. The one way I don't like him as a neoliberal sure. and the one way he seems to be standing with Russia, with Zimbabwe, and the ANC changing its position to more aggressively support ZANU-PF, a, li a fellow liberation movement. And I'm trying to reconcile why would this happen? And what I feel and what I think is happening is that Ciro himself has been betrayed. Okay. They have not unload they have not unlocked the 380 billion US dollars that is sitting as reserves in South African corporations. They have not please, re please pause there. You're saying South African companies are currently sitting on 380 billion US dollars, just yes. holding it. They don't yes. want to pump it into the economy. They don't want to pump it into the economy. Now, in 2017, when Future Growth, which was under Old Mutual, which was under Trevor Manuel, decided to withhold their money from South African state-owned enterprises, mm. I would understand that they did that because Zuma was in charge. Mm. But Cyril Ramaphosa took over, and he has been take, he has taken over for almost five years now, mm. and they haven't released money. Those corporations, South African white corporations, they're waiting for Cyril to clean up. They've not released money. People. That, that, that's what they keep saying. But some people are beginning to say they're waiting for the destruction of the ANC when mm -hmm. it loses its majority, so that it goes into coalition, so that the true leadership that they wanted to come in in the first place, the DA, comes into national power for a restitution of the most powerful system that this white monopoly capital had, which is the apartheid system. Why is the West not given? Cyril and Umbalula backlash for their utterings. Because there's a fight for the soul of the ANC in South Africa right now. You but see, but the West could hear Cyril say what he's saying and Balu and be like, "No, punish these guys." No, they're talking rubbish. They can't. And since Cyril's been in power, we've never been downgraded. Load shedding is at its worst. Losing jobs, becoming more of a welfare <laughs> state. <laughs> nothing from Moody's, S and P. Nothing. Quiet. Standard but, and poor. But ESCOM has never been worse than it is under Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, Transnet has never been as worse as under Cyril Ramaphosa. Mm. Um, SAA, SABC are all in crisis, much more than they were under Zuma, to the extent that no, Malusu Gugaba actually looks better than Praveen Goda. Sure. Right? But the reason that that is happening, the re now, the, you, I don't think Cyril is blind to the fact that they have sabotaged him to that extent. They've made who's, his who's presidency they? look worse than the Zuma presidency. They? White capital. The funders. The West. The bankers. I hear they you. They might not be downgrading, but in real terms, they have actually made Ciro run a much more difficult economy to I run. I hear you. That realization is why you're seeing South Africa realigning and taking its power or the position of power that it has in Africa to start playing uh, negotiations. Mm.
That's why you see Lavrov was here just two weeks Russian, ago. Russian, what is yes. he, finance minister? Uh, um, uh, de- minister of Defense, isn't he? Uh, I'm not state sure. Minister of State, state, state Security. State Security. Oh, because he uh, met with Naledi Pandu. I'm Pando. just forgetting his title. Okay. So he comes, and guess what? What's it? Janet Yellen is here this week. So there's a tug of war where Blinken has to come. Lavrov comes. Um, Lega- uh, what's the name of the lady I just spoke about now? Janet Yellen comes. Yeah. They're fighting for the soul of the ANC because it's a very important government on the African continent. So if they quickly punish, of which they're already punishing, mm. and both Ciro can feel that they're being punished. In fact, Ciro is feeling betrayed. Mm. I went in, I said to the people, to Mamina, to do your work, mm. to make sure that we keep South Africa neoliberal. And what you do is you kick me in the teeth by not giving me capital mm. to finance my, 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 my state-owned enterprises. The state-owned enterprises are falling apart. And everybody now thinks that they're falling apart because I'm destroying them for my own personal benefit. Mm. But that doesn't do anything for my presidency and my legacy. So he has to now say, okay, if you are not going to give me everything that I want, I, need, I think I need new allies. Mm. So when Cyril came in, he never strengthened the BRICS relationship. Now sure. they're beginning to talk about strengthening the BRICS relationship. I heard Naledi Pando saying that they actually think that BRICS must create its own currency so that dependency on the US dollar is re- reduced. I don't take politicians seriously. It sounds like a good idea, though. But I think that the moves are being made. And the 20, Americans 20, can hear the rhetoric and they understand that the rhetoric is real. Why? Because for the first time since the fall of the Soviet empire, we actually have two different uh, poles groups. that are beginning to form. And the BRICS power group is actually looking stronger and is looking like it's got more longevity mm. than the US and the Western group. The, the, the Northern Alliance group or North Atlantic group, mm. I think they're, they're dying out. And South Africa is being told by partners. And Zimbabwe has played an instrumental role because Zimbabwe has been leaning east for the longest period since sanctions happened. Zimbabwe is beginning to say, you might lose elections. You need to know who your partners are. You Zuma, need to understand. Zuma was right. You need to understand that who you, where you are and where we are as an OPF is the same boat. Zuma was right. About because what? He was very big on BRICS. He was speaking nuclear. And Cyril tried to do what you're saying he was trying to do, and he failed. And now he's going to that Zuma thing of BRICS and potentially nuclear. Zuma was right, yes, but Zuma had a problem. Zuma was, um, he, he spoke the right words, but ideologically he was always, he was ideologically bankrupt. I'll tell you the reasons why. Um, Kabesi John, um, Kabesi, what's his name? Um, the um, Jonas. No. Des van Rooyen. No, no, no. The young man who was part and parcel of the fees must fall. Kabo um, Jamin. Kabo Jamin. He was arrested under Zuma. Mm. Gaddafi was murdered under Zuma after Zuma voted with the North North Atlantic uh, 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 Treaty with the, with NATO. But weren't they close to Zuma no Gaddafi? How can you be close with somebody you vote against? How? There's right? rumors that Zuma's got a property in Dubai and some of it is Gaddafi's money. And I don't some know. of Gaddafi's money apparently is a Swatini as well. With Remember, the they used to say Mugabe also had palaces in Scotland and had palaces all across the world. Sure. Mugabe's wife is still living in Zimbabwe today, even though she fell out with the current president at some point. Sure. She lives in Zimbabwe today. She could have gone to live in Scotland. She could have gone to live anywhere. She's been removed from the sanctions list. She's in Zim. Okay. So there was an allegation that she had properties all across the world. There's no evidence to that at this particular moment. Zuma is there in England. When they arrested him, why didn't he run to the to Dubai where they, where they said? So I don't know. I don't believe that. But I question Zuma's uh, 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 integrity. You're saying he was ideologically bankrupt. Ideologically bankrupt. How do fee, fees must fall arrests happen under a watch of a person that is, that, that is uh, left-leaning? How does Gaddafi get killed by the vote of your own uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and your, 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 your what you call it, your uh, diplomat within the UN? How do you have Marikana and the shooting of black people 
uh, for asking for wages to be increased mm -hmm. happen under your leadership? How does Julius Malema get ejected from the ANC for asking his elders to undertake land reform. Sure, and uh, nationalization. Exactly, and nationalization. Then you say you're radical economic transformation. Sure. So why was Julius Malema removed from the ANC, if that's the case? So that ideological imbalance mm. makes me wonder whether Zuma was actually serious about any of the things that he said he wanted to do. Mm. And why didn't he execute? It's one thing to want to do radical economic transformation. It's another thing to do it. Was he not scared of destabilizing the economy because of the power hold of the West? I always say to people, the South African economy is destabilized already. I'll say, I'll tell you why. This morning I wrote a tweet in which I was saying, South Africa is the richest country in Africa for whites, who when you look at 7 million whites controlling 93% of the South African economy, their income per capita is over, over $56,000. Uh, uh, dollars mm. every year. That's American level, US level. Mm. But the black South Africans who constitute uh, 54 million people in mm. South Africa have to share 7% of the economy. And when you look at that income per capita per person, it's 550 US dollars a year. That means black South Africans have a lower income per capita than any other African country. So they're the poorest Africans so to speak. That's destabilized already. You've said That's this why. before, and I, I remember it was one of the things we had to discuss, that you've said, and this is important for me as a black South African, black South Africans pride themselves almost on having the best whites on the continent. We had whites that built ESCOM and Cecil, <laughs> and that's why we're better than you and we beat our chests. But your argument is, sure, you guys live in Santon, or we say you live in Santon. But you actually in Alex, and now let's compare Alex to what you claim are poorer blacks in Nigeria, the Congo, Sudan, and they actually live better than you. Black people are not doing that like for like comparison. Yeah. We're boasting about, oh, look at Vitz University. You never built Vitz. And its greatness comes from the white Jewish business people. Boast about, they didn't even build Forte, but boast about an institution you've built. And you're basically saying black people in South Africa who are 80% only own 7% of the economy. And when you split it, it's 550 US dollars per and black person. And white people, and I think in your tweet, you also spoke about Indians. Mm -hmm. They control 93% of the economy. Yeah. And per person, that's about 56,000 US dollars. Yes. We're living in two different worlds. Two different worlds. And remember, what many black South Africans don't understand when I comment is that I am literally a black South African because I've lived the black South African life. Mm. I've lived a life where the house that I'm living in wasn't mine. The car that I was driving outside wasn't mine. The clothes I was wearing belonged to a clothing uh, uh, a retailer mm. who I'm still paying. The perfume I'm using was also from Edgar's. Mm. And sometimes the groceries that I'm eating were, 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 were bought by credit card yeah. uh, at Woolies. And at that time, when I used to go to Zimbabwe, I would get to Zimbabwe and I'd take out my rands and Zimbabweans would say, don't worry about your rands. We know you don't have money. <laughs> because, because these guys, I'm sitting in his house, he owns the house that we're yeah. sitting in. He's got cows at the village or his farm. Yeah. He's got cars, every car in, the, in, his, in his parking lot is his. His children go to expensive private schools and everything that he's doing is paying cash. One of the scariest realizations that I had, so... I think the bulk of South Africans, 70%, I could be wrong, 70% of their income goes to servicing debt. People that live in villages in South Africa, from an accounting perspective, net worth, assets minus liabilities, <laughs> are wealthier than most of us living in nice homes in the city because assets min minus liabilities, the guy with three cows and a hut, and two hectares of land is wealthier than me because I you mean this it. nice house, I've got this nice car. You got it. But I've got a negative because I still have I'm enslaved for 20 years for the house, maybe six, seven years for the car. And even after that, there's still insurance and 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 it's it's sobering. And whoever brought debt, credit, not just to the continent, but to the world, were the people that probably convinced slave owners, Wuti, we've we've actually found a better system. 
take off the chains, they'll chain themselves and they'll chase debt and poverty and they'll work hard and they'll have anxiety and depression and commit suicide. But you'll be like, look, it's their choice. <laughs> we weren't involved. He wants... Now, it's crazy. Now, do you now understand why the fight that is happening in the ANC is happening? But you, you still want us to vote ANC. Hold on. <sighs> because this slave system that you've spoken about is precisely the problem. Because I am now sitting as a member of the NEC in the ANC. And I've got a six million rand house. I've got two cars. Yeah. I've got children in private schools. I might want them to go to Harvard or the you know, uh, Ovitz. And all this that I own is debt. Yeah. It's not mine. Yeah. And I know that the moment I go against the owners of the debt, I could lose everything. Everything. And end up walking and getting on a taxi again yeah. tomorrow. Now, I understand that if you're a member of the NEC, you can no longer get on a taxi because if you do, you might even get stabbed. Hmm. There are people who hate what you've been yeah. doing all along. So those people to self-preserve have no option. There was a, there's, a, there's a program right now done by SABC about Inkabi. In fit, can you imagine Inkabi with Zingaba busy Ganjani if they had to start dealing with politicians who've fallen from grace? Mm. No longer have bodyguards, no longer have nice cars. They would be so busy killing people who a lot of people would pay big money because I lost this tender and that tender and that tender. Or John Wick. You're unborn. You contracts. Exactly. So these people have to self preserve. And mo most politicians in this country, I, I also was one of the people that didn't, most of them are not business people. Most of them don't have the money we think they have. No. Most of them are career politicians and it's part of the reason old people don't want to leave politics because they literally have no other real income source. Now, what, while that is happening, you've now got Zano PF that's saying to these guys, Wafit, do you realize that right now, Umzi Kumalo, it was mining gold in the biggest gold mine in Zimbabwe. And you can come and do the same. Any South African come in, can come and do the same. But okay, what's but right? He's the biggest supplier of fuel. He's a multi-billionaire. He supplies 3 billion liters of fuel every year in this country. He was created in Zimbabwe. He'll never get broke because of servicing Zimbabwe. About the ANC, but okay, see how cool. And talking about Kuda Tagure, let me tell you a story. Umakaz. You spoke was, about Kuda last time. Ne? Yeah. What's his company? Uh, Sakunda. Sakunda. It's the biggest company in Zimbabwe. It's the biggest supplier of fuel in Zimbabwe. I told you I had reservations because it sounds like a Patrice manufactured <laughs> by like a Russian oligarch, but <laughs> you, you claim it's legit. And he's, he's legit. At least I'm a, I'm a curious mind, so I'd like to learn more about him so that he can inspire specifically other black Zimbabwean kids that you can make money in Zim and Zim is waiting for you. We don't want him to be only an example to Zimbabwean kids. We want him to be an example to Southern Africa and black South Africans. Sure. So, but yes, but this guy can give you even Imali a campaign. He's got the money. Mm. And you can create the same in Zimbabwe just by changing the laws, because that's how we created people like him. Sure. That's how Strive Masiwa was created, because we created the laws. Strive is popular. Dollar billionaire. So Dollar look, Kuda, Kuda, Kuda controls Kuda. platinum. Mm -hmm. He controls nickel. Nickel is the biggest export from Zim right now. I would have never guessed. He controls the big, he's got the biggest, some of the biggest gold mines in the country too. Now, understand this guy. Kuda. He's providing all the, all the fuel. Kuda needs to become my friend. Uh, yeah, he probably does. But point I'm saying is that South Africa can create more Kudas. Yeah. By just changing the policy. And once they create more Kudas... The guy in, in ANC doesn't have to worry whether the white capital like what he says or not. But they say that's what Zuma was trying to do. But he didn't do it right. And the or, problem, or he gave and, it to and, the wrong people. And that probably works. A lot what of these scares other guys me, make what, money what, and they blow it. Where they get it wrong is this. Yeah. Zimbabwe has got a case study that South Africa should be using. Like page for page. Sure. For instance, the ESCOM story. It's told in Zimbabwe within the Zisco Steel story. Zimbabwe, Zisco steel. Zimbabwe used to have the biggest steel and iron mill in, in the southern hemisphere. Crazy. In Brazil, there was nothing as big. In Australia, there was nothing as big as the biggest in the southern hemisphere. This steel mill had the shareholding of Anglo-America, the shareholding of uh, Messina, the shareholding of Isco, the shareholding of uh, Lancaster Steel and Wust Alpine. Hectic. And it was huge. So it was creating... Uh, uh, steel for, 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 for mining, steel for uh, railway systems. The problem is Anglo did not like this power being in black hands. Mm. 
And number two, they're the country, they're the company called Hagirandi that produces wire for mining, uh, my, mining uh, uh, shafts mm. and elevators and mining business. They produce, the Zimbabwean company produced better steel at a cheaper price than Anglo. Mm. So Anglo is a shareholder within uh, uh, Zisco Steel, had the ear of the government of Zimbabwe, mm. which was still new. We didn't understand the ways of the world. Mm. The CEO of Zisco Steel was a white guy called Kuhn, who was coming from the Austrian company called Wust Alpine that provided all the machinery at Zisco. So they listened to these guys. Sure. What they didn't understand is that these guys had a mandate from the US government and the British government and the Europeans to destroy this steel plant that was in the hands of blacks because it gave blacks too much power to industrialize with the biggest steel mill in Africa. So what they did is they started telling the Zimbabwean government that no, we cannot have two steel buying or two steel manufacturing companies in Zimbabwe. We can't have Lancaster Steel, which is Zimbabwean owned, British, but Zimbabwean controlled, mm -hmm. and then Hagirande, which was owned by, by Anglo-America. So Anglo-America said, no, let Hagirande be the one that exists. Let us buy Lancaster Steel. Their idea was to destroy Lancaster Steel, which was producing steel that was competing with them here, mm -hmm. but more importantly, to destroy Lancaster Steel, which is the biggest buyer of Zisco Steel steel, so that they can then break Zisco Steel once they've destroyed its biggest buyer sure. and its biggest sophisticator of iron. The Zimbabwean government being gullible, this need for approval from whites, and the power that Anglo-America had, because they had the 35% control of the Zimbabwean economy, just like it has a 60% control of the South African economy even till today. So the Zimbabwean government listened to what Anglo said. They you listened to what the CEO said. You owe me. Sorry. Please carry on. So they did, they, they, they did start destroying Lancaster Steel. They started sabotaging Lancaster Steel. When Hagirande from Anglo needed the price increases, they gave it. When Lancaster Steel said, we also need a price increase, they didn't give it. Sure. Eventually, Zisco then bought Lancaster Steel. The moment it bought Lancaster Steel, that same white CEO was there. And I'm going to give you an example. This white CEO in my mind is uh, Andre, Andre De Reiter. Andre De Reiter. Huh? From ESCOM. They decided that they were going to, he decided before he resigned mm. that I'm going to give the contract to buy all of Lancaster Steel Steel to Anglo-America. Sure. He did that. He resigned. He left. I wonder, what, I wonder what Andre has signed now that he's resigning. We don't think of things like that. <laughs> we don't think of things like Who that. Who is placed, what deals is signed. You get it. And then leave. But do you get where I'm going with you? And that, now you're tied. Whoever you comes get, in is tied. Do you get where I'm saying to, to you that ESCOM shouldn't be happening if South Africans had sat down to study what happened with Zisco, yeah. number one. And that's just one issue. There's another issue. In Zimbabwe, when we got independence, 30% of the whites that were in Zimbabwe were white South Africans. 30%? 30% were white South Africans. 50. And most of them were actually intelligence officials from the apartheid system. You we didn't sorry, know that. You're saying, sorry, 30% of white people in Zim? Yes. Before people are At like, independence. 30, people are saying 30% of the population. 30% uh -uh. of the white population in Zim yes. was white South Africans. Was white South Africans. All right? So you're looking at about 30% of about 220,000 people? Sure. Those guys were in industry in Zimbabwe. Mm. They were in the military in Zimbabwe. They were in the Air Force in Zimbabwe. Mm. So when we get independence, we leave them there in the name of reconciliation. Because mm. we want to show that the thing we are familiar. fighting a system. Guess what they do? The very first year of independence, white guys who were in the Zimbabwean Air Force went and bombed 40% of Zimbabwe's aeroplanes. Mm. New planes that had been bought from the British. And this was to help the apartheid government destroy Zimbabwe's Air Force so that it would not resist them in the air when they start having wars within the region. Not only did they do that, they go to a barrack that we call Nkomo Barracks. Nkomo Barracks had our weapons. They went and destroyed a good amount of those weapons. They bombed them. They went to KG-6, another military base. They tried to bomb a military equipment there, and they tried to do the same thing at Krenbon Barracks. Now, and then while they're doing that, they went to bomb Zanopi Evade headquarters trying to kill Robert Ngabe and his entire cabinet. These were whites in the system White who we Africans. left there. 
Are you saying it's white South Africans or just the white? The, it was white people? South Africans and Rhodesians, white Engl- white Englishmen. Okay. Immediately when all this this happened, what would happen is that the moment that they were caught, they would be put into prison. The people who'd be investigating them are white officers, white detectives. Guess what would happen in two three days time? South Africa would send a private jet. It would land. This guy would say, "I'm taking the prisoners for interrogation," and then they'll take the prisoners, and then and then they take both the investigator and the the the, 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 the whites. Into South safety. Africa. And in South Africa, they came in here, they went into intelligence, and they went straight into the, uh, 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 um, what you call it, the army. What am I trying to say to you? I'm trying to say to you, you have still got the reconciliation that Zimbabwe did at the beginning here in South Africa. In your army, these people exist. In your air force, these people exist. In ESCOM, they are the one running ESCOM. They're destroying these things. So ask yourself, what are they going to start doing one day? But you to still your, want us to, to vote planes. for the ANC, though. No! If you don't vote for the ANC, who else are you going to vote for? For the same people who would destroy your aeroplanes if the ANC is in charge or this the ones people, that want to control those this aeroplanes. This is why people so. don't want to vote. Because you're almost <laughs> making it seem like you're voting between dog shit and chicken poo. ANC has got the power to make the change. So but they're they, not. So 30 listen, minutes, listen. 30 years later. Had they learned the lesson from Zimbabwe? But they haven't. No, hold on. Had they learned the lesson from Zimbabwe? At ESCOM, they would have known that we cannot have the enemy. And remember, the enemy you have here is a criminal enemy. It's, they are like Nazis who were left in power. They are like, um, 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 yeah, they are like Nazis who were kept, like, left in power. If you remember, to rebuild Germany, you, they had to arrest the Nazis and the criminals of the Nazi empire mm. to restart and the, re- the rebuilding of Germany. Mm. You, they didn't reconcile with them. Sure. That's what should happen we, we in are South Africa. People. We believe, <laughs> believe in Ubuntu. You can't believe in Ubuntu with a criminal. These criminals are criminals against humanity, the highest form of criminality. You've allowed them to control the media and to control your minds. But in Germany, they immediately criminalized Nazis. And if any Nazi went on radio and tried to advance Nazi propaganda, they would be arrested today in Germany. They'll be arrested in Israel. Why are you allowing Nazis? Apartheid criminals, apartheid apologists to be the ones who run your radios, your television stations. Why haven't you criminalized them? Because if you don't, they will perpetuate their crimes against humanity through the system. That's why they removed the Nazis. That's why they killed them. That's why they hung them. That's why they took their companies. Do you know that Germany today, many people don't know, Germany is a colony of the United States. Why do I say that? All their companies... Were contr- the companies of Germany used to be controlled privately, mm-hmm. and they used to be funded through what was called window uh, w- w- um, um, window targeting. Mm-hmm. They would create money and print money through the uh, German central bank without interest because they were not Rothschild-owned banks. And they would give those loans at 0% interest to the German companies that they wanted to grow. That's why Germany is technologically advanced. Mm. So they would target it into technology. They would target it into the military industry, shipbuilding, aeroplane building. They used to do the same in Japan. The Japanese government would do window targeting. We're going to target people that manufacture cars because we want to make Toyota the best car in the world. Mm. And they would print money. Government would actually get its reserve bank, which it owned, to print money and target it specifically to those industries. Mm. No interest. That's why Japan and Germany were the fastest growing economies, and that's why their economies were able to develop military equipment and the industries that dominate the world today. Even today, they're top three. Even today, economies. they are top three. But now, when America defeated them, and the war was so that they take away those banks from government control into Rothschild and private control. But when they took over that system, they stopped the system where the banks owned by the government fund the industry. And they started saying that the companies must be owned by private capital, and they created the stock exchange system. Stock exchange, let me jump in there. So they Uh created, let me finish. So they created the stock exchange system to allow private capital from outside Germany to control German industry. And guess who's the biggest funders of German industry? America and the British. So they own that industry. Then next, what did they do in this reform? They killed the Nazis, they arrested them, put them in prison. They followed them everywhere they went to uh, uh, Argentina and everything. And lastly, they put their soldiers. Boom. 
Germany and Japan today have the biggest number of American soldiers and bases on their soil mm -hmm. because they're occupied countries. Yeah. They're not allowed to do certain things by their own constitutions. Sounds more like South Africa, doesn't it? Yeah. So what you guys were supposed to do is to deconstruct the apartheid system, take over their companies, dismantle the exchange, the, the stock exchange system that allows the Americans, BlackRock, Vanguard, uh, and Fidelity, controlling your economy. And you should have made sure that you jailed apartheid criminals, destroyed their communication mechanisms that are now continuing to give you problems in this country. The ANC didn't do so that. Why, so lastly, so why am I saying that the ANC must be voted for? Because they can still do what I'm saying. For their own survival, they can still do what I'm saying. So you speak about um, stock exchanges. Um, and you mentioned Anglo-American owning 60% of our economy. From our first chat, I wanted us to unpack who owns the South African economy. Because I've said before, one of my favorite videos that you've made was unpacking the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, etc. I'll, I'll start by saying this before I, I let you go uh, on. I believe, we haven't done enough research, but I believe Anglo-American is the biggest mafia company on the African continent. When I do any bit of research in some of the biggest companies on the continent, somewhere there, deep, dark, there's a shareholding or a, and I'm just like, <laughs> you look at Cecil John Rhodes, Barney Bonato, you look at, some of our newspapers, you look at some of our industry and you're just like, who are these guys? And the way they come in is it's always protection. It's always, if you don't listen to us, we, we can't protect you from external forces. <laughs> if you don't give us a shareholding, you won't get funding. You, it's a mess, sorry. So you owe me and I, I hope we can actually do this finally. Who owns the South African economy? And, it, and it's interesting that we're having this discussion now at a time where we've already started creating context from the German economy and the Russian, I mean, and the Japanese economy and how they are colonies, just like South Africa, yeah. because of private capital ownership of the economy. Now, in as much as we say that Anglo-America is a, is a, a juggernaut mm -hmm. and a mafia, we must also re remember that Anglo-America itself is created by Jewish capital that came from Germany. So the Oppenheimers are people who came from Germany. Then they got funding from Jewish bankers in New York to create uh, Anglo-America in, in about 19, 1914 to about 1917. Anglo-American is British American. Anglo-American no, no, no. is Anglo actually- Anglo is English? Uh, Anglo is German. That's I mean, what I mean and the Oppenheimers are German. No, I mean the term Anglo is not English. Yeah, it, it, Anglo, Anglo comes from Anglo-Saxons. Okay. And Anglo-Saxons were German, were, were, were the German sex Coburg family okay. that went to become the kings and queens of uh, uh, Britain and the rest of Europe. King so the sex Coburgs. Britain, okay. So Germany so when you, to Britain to America. Okay. <laughs> and if you really think about it, Jewish capital traveled like that. The mm -hmm. Jewish capital starts with the Rothschild, the Schaefers, and the, um, 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 what is that other, other family? The, no, no, not the Medicis, but they came from Germany. Okay, and then they spread into France. So France used to be the biggest center of Jews before we had uh, the second, the First World War. Okay, and then the Jews then moved from France after they caused the French Revolution that created capitalism, and then they moved into England and to America. Okay, so by the time we get to the Second World, First World War, the the biggest capital for Jews is no longer France, but is now uh, 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 England. Okay. And then when we come from the First World War and America is beginning to show that it's becoming the biggest power in the world, the capital moves where? To, 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 to America. Yeah. But when you understand that even the American capital system was funded by the Rothschilds, where you had people like J.P. Morgan going to learn banking mm. and investment banking in London, and then taking capital that it was given in London by London financiers, who obviously are the Rothschilds. That's how he comes and starts creating the American economy. The same thing happened in South Africa. Sure. Cecil John Rhodes, Alfred Bait, these people were funded, Bani Banato, by the Rothschild capital. Sure. By German uh, Jewish capital to create this. And this is what is called 
the black aristocracy, this, this, this Jewish capital class that has got the investment banks and uh, the global capital. And to some extent, because they funded all the big companies, Anglo-America is funded by the Rothschilds. Mm. It's a Rothschild company, so to speak. Okay. To a certain extent, the Oppenheimers are just caretakers. I've, and I've, I've heard of that argument, and it's one of the things we don't speak about enough, that some of our favorite wealthy people might be just representatives of certain interests, whether it's a Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Johan Rupert, Nikki Oppenheimer. They might just be caretakers, like we accuse Obel Cyril of certain bigger interest groups. Now, elsewhere. you have to understand that you're not the only people that are puzzled by this phenomenon. Mm. We've got Henry Ford, who was a multi-billionaire, the guy who created the first car, one of the richest Americans, and among the five titans that created the American economy, he's counted there. Yeah. But even he commissioned a newspaper that he owned to write a book trying to explain the phenomenon of the international Jew. Because he was saying, good, yes, it's not Mali, but that's not Mali, because the money that I have to run this enterprise called uh, 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 Ford, Ford, the money that Carnegie has, the money that Vanderbilt has, mm. at the end of the day, that money is still Jewish capital. So he wrote an entire book called The International Jew to try and understand why. Mm. Why are Jews so powerful? Why do they control governments? Mm. Why do they control nations? And why is it that every country that they live, they leave? falls apart. He then goes on to talk about how it is that America itself was created by Jews who were chased away from Spain. Christopher Columbus was founded by Jews. Mm -hmm. Those Jews go and land in, in America. They create the tobacco industry, which then finances, uh, 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 um, 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 what do we call it, Dutch-owned Peter Stuyvesant, who controls New York. That's the same pattern you see here. And these Dutch go hand in hand with that because they were good administrators and project managers. Even till today, when you Even go to the Netherlands, uh, 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 when you go to the Netherlands, I remember when I first went to the Netherlands, I went by train, mm. came from France into, into, into Belgium, and all of a sudden, I see everything changes. The train goes into a glass tunnel. The grounds, the fields, are they look like they're from a picture in a book. And I'm like, what, what place is this? The Netherlands is stunning. And they said, this is the Netherlands. Sure. And I began to understand why the Dutch are what they are and why you guys have a problem with the Boers. They're organized. Mm. They're project managers. Yeah. They get things done. I wanted to say, sorry, when you speak about Jewish people being organized, that lawyers, accountants, very key, bankers, um, a lot of them around the world are, are Jewish people. Exactly. So they, they, they link it to education, that they value education, etc. So it was that. I wanted you to finish the count. <laughs> yeah. Andrew Carnegie, sorry, Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, Vanderbilt, J um, J.D. Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. um, is J.P. Morgan in there? J.P. Mo Morgan, yeah. Okay, those are the five Americans that literally built America into what it became. Okay. And J.P. Morgan was a major funder, and his funding came from the Rothschild. Like I told you, he went to school in America. The okay. same thing happened here with Cecil John Rhodes. Mm -hmm. Cecil John Rhodes was given money. Bunny Barnato was given money. Mm -hmm. Alfred Bate was given money. They became what are called the landlords. Sure. Those landlords began to control Kimberley. They began to control the gold in South Africa. And people say there was no mining of gold happening in Southern Africa. There was. That's why there was the Mutapa Empire in Zimbabwe. Mm. That Mutapa Empire mined gold, and there was gold being mined in Mapungubwe. Mapungubwe That's why rhino. there's actually that golden rhino. But I they don't Mapungubwe. tell you that because they want to make it sound like they discovered, they discovered gold. gold. They didn't. They knew of the ancient civilizations. Jan van Riebeek, when he got here, he actually had the book that talked about Mapungubwe, that talked about the Mutapa Empire and the gold that was there. And they wanted to find it, but Sisu John Rhodes found it first. Jacob Zuma, in giving um, a lecture of South African history, a summary in Parliament, says something cool when he speaks about white people say they discovered <laughs> when in fact they came across. <laughs> it's a nice laughable moment in him explaining that from your perspective, you discovered, but we were already here mm. and we were fine. And the truth of the matter is that's not a discovery. If I'm the one mining the gold and then you learn that I'm mining the gold, I'm mining diamonds, and then you begin to do the same. Discovered or you South take Africa. it from me. Discovered. Mm. So that capital that was then given to Sisu John Rose mm. by the Rothschilds 
to start creating a formal economy of mining within the country sure. is what began to own this country's foundations. So every business person that wanted to mine when Cecil John Rhodes consolidated mm. mining of diamonds under De Beers in Kimberley and sooner or later did the same thing with gold fields in uh, Johannesburg, it meant the entire economy and its base system mm. was controlled by Rothschild money, which was under Cecil John Rhodes. When Cecil John Rhodes dies, mm. the Oppenheimers come and take over Goldfields and the interests, De Beers, and the interests of Cecil John Rhodes. Ernest Oppenheimer. Yes. And the first place he quadruples the value of the money that was in Cecil John Rhodes' fund was when he goes to Namibia and discovers the kimberlite or diamonds that get carried from Lesotho mm. through the Orange River all the way down to uh, the coast of Namibia where those diamonds are dumped into the sea. Mm. Anglo-America discovered that. And they discovered the cleanest, clearest diamonds ever in Namibia that used, just used to be picked up off the beach that were coming from Lesotho. And that's what they used to start making huge money that was then invested into many industries. Now, when you start understanding the web of industries, sure. The Oppenheimers became the biggest producers of gold, the biggest producers of diamonds. Mm. So they created the biggest company to control diamonds, De Beers. They created the laws to control diamonds all across the world. Sure. They created the central, uh, 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 it's, it's called CSO, the Central Selling Organization, mm. to sell the diamonds. Because diamonds were not, they were not in short supply. Diamonds are actually a, 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 a non-precious stone found all over the world. Mm. So Cecil John Rhodes and the Oppenheimers specialized in controlling the supply, closing up wherever there's a diamond mine so that it doesn't go onto the market and then they can then control the, 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 the supply and therefore the price. This is still in effect today? Yes. Because a lot of people don't know that the beers literally, it's... It's almost like what happens in, in any country in South Africa. Anything you find under the ground belongs to government. You cannot discover diamonds. No. <laughs> they almost have a monopoly on all that. They have to go through them. They need to verify. And that's they why they created the Kimberley process. If you do not go through the Kimberley process, if your diamonds are not around sold Around the, the world. Around the world. Because what they're trying to do is to control the diamonds. And that's why you saw they started putting, they started uh, criminalizing people like like Vive from 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 uh, Israel, uh, people like uh, Dan Gertlan, because they were oh, trying. Oh, Dan Gertlan from the DRC. <laughs> yes, the capture of the DRC and the Kapila family. But now this is where it gets interesting with gold and platinum. They decided then to create something different. Mm -hmm. Number one, they created the refineries that refine gold and diamonds. So. Oppenheimers began to own what is called Jason Mathy. Okay. Jason Mathy is a British company that does smelting of gold, silver, and platinum. Mm -hmm. So they got shares in Jason Mathy. In America, they used to have a, another American company owned by a German Jew as well called Engelhardt. Mm -hmm. They started controlling Engelhardt that does smelting of gold and platinum and silver in America. These are the two biggest companies that refine and purify gold, platinum, and silver. Mm. They were now under the control of, uh, 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 what you call it, the Oppenheimers. Sure. So you would mine gold in South Africa. It would not be purified or refined by anyone else but these two companies. Mm. So that way, even if you're not part and parcel of the Oppenheimer uh, uh, conglomerate, you still have to sell your gold, you still have to send your gold through their uh, uh, refineries. Through refineries. Basif in Germany also has a refinery. Mm. Right. Then the next thing they did is they created the London bullion market. That's gold. I mean, the, the London, the, it, was, it, was, it was London, uh, yeah, the London bullion market. For gold. Yeah. What that does, it's not only gold, gold and platinum. Okay. I didn't know and that. other precious metals. So okay. what they do is they sit as a cartel of Western banks. This cartel then decides to do what is called market um, price fixing. They determine the price of gold, they determine the price of platinum, they determine the price of silver every day. And they tell you. And then that gold, when it comes, guess who buys it? 
the, Roth, the Rothschilds buy the majority of it, the platinum, and then sell it to the rest of the market. So they determine the price. They fix the price. That's not market economics. That is not a free market economic sure. system. That is a monopolistic system. It's a price fixing system. And we've got the competition commission in South Africa to stop that from happening. <laughs> I've got two quick, quick ones. The first one so, is- so let, let me leave you, let me leave you where we can understand. So they began to control the marketing of that gold. So they, re sure. they control the refining, they control the marketing. And then they began to buy a company that was called um, Philip, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a commodity trading company that is in America. The Not biggest Morris. control. Uh, okay. that, it's, 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 it's called Philip. Uh, I'm just forgetting the name. Sure. So they buy this commodity broking company. It's the biggest commodity broking company in the world, even bigger Philip than Brothers. Glencoe. Huh? Not Philip Brothers? Phil Brothers. Phil, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was. I it know was something, Philip, Nintendo. I know something. Give Philip's me a little bit of Solomon, credit. Solomon's. The, it was, the, there was first of all Solomon Brothers, sure. and then there was Phillips, and then they came together. But you know your stuff. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, so now they're controlling commodity broking. So you produce a commodity, they buy it. Yeah. When you now want to refine it, they refine it, and when you now want to market it, they give you the price. So they controlled global. Global commodity broking, mining, and uh, selling. And with that, South African miners have no option. Platinum miners, diamond miners, gold miners. Mm. You have nowhere else to sell your product but these than guys. through them. You've got nowhere else to refine your product than through them. Mm. Well, then these, and so now every single refinery in the world has to be associated with the London uh, uh, bullion. Uh, bullion market. Mm. So now this is why you hear Rwanda now has a smelter. That smelter is now associated and linked with the London bullion market. So it can now refine and its gold is accepted by the London bullion market. Zimbabwe had what is called uh, uh, Fidelity Printers. Fidelity Printers had accreditation with the London bullion market. The moment we went under sanctions, we then reduced the production of gold because you have to produce, I think, over 10 tons of gold every single every single year. Mm. So they lost their license. But it's not only you losing. So it's against sanctions being used to make you lose credibility, make you lose your position to refine your gold and give it to the rest of the world. Mm. So till today, Anglo-America controls the production of gold, the marketing of gold, the marketing of platinum, marketing of gold, silver, and other precious metals through other exchanges, particularly in Singapore. Mm. Right now, if you want to sell coal, uh, so there's a time I wanted to get in the coal business. Mm. There's no coal owned by the South African government. So you have to apply to mining companies for coal. The biggest coal miner in this country remains Anglo-America, followed by Exaro and, 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 and Rio Tinto and uh, Glencoe, mm. and then Sasso. Where does BHP? Is BHP somewhere there? Yeah, BHP is there as well. Okay. Because you've got seven major uh, uh, mining companies that mine the bulk of South Africa's coal and provide ESCOM and the South African market with almost 89% of its coal. Can we pause there? The Oppenheimers were German. German. Okay, that's the first thing. The you Rothschilds said, were German. You said German Jewish. You know, when, when you mentioned, or when we came across the Philip brothers, uh, how I know about them is Mark Rich, because he used to work for Philip brothers, and he was a German Jewish guy. He was Mark Reich, and then they didn't like that name when they got to America, yeah, yeah, so they yeah, changed yeah. to Rich. Oh, yes. They no, gave birth to Glenn Cole. Oh, it's, 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 no, but weren't they Russians? They were Jews I from believe Russia. they were German Jews. German Russians. Check it out. You're saying they're Russian? Yes. Okay. But anyways, German I, Russians. But I, same thing. I know he was Jewish and and but mm. anyways, so I just I wanted to mention that there was another question, but it's it slipped me now. It's fine. But please can continue you see, with the coal, 89% from seven companies. From seven companies. Of which Glencoe is a breakaway from Mark Rich and Company. Mm -hmm. And Mark Rich was groomed at Philip Brothers, which, as you rightly said, were the biggest commodity trading company at that time. And then Mark Rich came and became a cowboy. And he gave birth to our other cowboys. We've got your Ivan Klassenbergs <laughs> now. And and, <laughs> and he was arrested, Mark Rich. He mm. was ar arrested for corruption. He was arrested for... for, for he for. ran away from America. <laughs> he never went back. He was wanted till he passed away wealthy in Switzerland. And he was safe. But now, with what you're saying, you've just confirmed to me 
that Glencore is a creation of Phil Brothers. And if Glencore is a creation of Phil Brothers, Glencore is Anglo-America. If you, if you look at the, you've just made a link that is interesting sure. to talk about how big this Anglo-American capital is and, 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 and its control of not only South Africa, but, you know, the globe. You have just been able to make a link between uh, Phil Brothers, mm -hmm. and they now call it Phil Bro, yeah. and the creation of Glencoe. Yeah. And if you look, these are the biggest mining companies in South Africa. And so that's Oppenheimer money can be seen and Oppenheimer influence can be seen in the control of the production of gold in mm -hmm. South Africa, the commodity broking, and the production of any resource here because Glencoe is there, Open, uh, 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 thingy, what do you call it? Uh, uh, um, Anglo, uh, Anglo America is there, and even their offshoots. Some people say there's links with implants. Now, this is what Kwame Nkrumah dis called a combine. Mm. He said that all these businesses that were created by Jewish capital, mm. Rothschild money at the end, uh, at, the, at the beginning, and came to exploit Africa, uh, South America, and uh, uh, Asia. If you look at them, they are one and the same people that have cross shareholding. They pick the directors. The directors are in one company and many others. It's called a combine. Mm. I wonder if there's a link. <laughs> My mate, Rob Hersoff, <laughs> shout out to Rob. His grandfather, I think Basil Hersoff and Slip Manel, they founded Anglo Fall. Yes. And you know, when I first heard of Anglo Fall, which has been broken down into uh, AVI, Anglo Fall Industries, um, Avenge, Anglo Fall Engineering. Um, and then I think the, there was the mining part, which of which some of it ended up with Patrice Mutsipe, I think in African Rainbow Minerals. Um, the Anglo part, which you were trying to break down. And I think when you look at the history, I think the family up Basel and before them I think Jewish as well. Yes. Uh, and I think you may have said before that Russian Jewish, not German Jewish. That, that, that's uh, and what I wonder you if there's it. a link with the Anglo American. Heads off, heads off, heads off, heads off, parents. I can't make the link because I, I haven't read up on that enough. Sure. But that Anglo says something. Sure. And, and, and this just brings me up to, to Rob. A lot of people think Rob is just another white guy with money. He is exactly at the level of the Oppenheimers and the, uh, uh, what you call it, um, uh, the Sister John Roses of this world. Mm. They are at the pinnacle of being facilitators of imperialism on behalf of this Jewish capital. Imperialism. Of, oh, yeah. I have to defend Rob. So, so one of the things I appreciate about Rob is that he owns his, he hates this term, his privilege. He says, I was very blessed, very lucky. My parents afforded me a great education, etc. And the other thing he acknowledges to what you're saying is his grandfather did really, really well in terms of what they built with Anglo Fall and what it's been broken down into today. And I've got no issue. They have, the, the thing is, like I said, we're not the first people to be asking questions about the Jews. Sure. Even people like Henry Ford ask these questions. Mm -hmm. It's called the Jewish question. Sure. But what the Jews never want to admit is that they have used exploitation, primitive accumulation, from the time that they started this thing in uh, the French Revolution to start capitalism. It was based on utilizing force, utilizing uh, genocide to kill people in order to control the resources. And it's not the Jews that did it. They used other people to do it. You're so, going to get cancelled like Kanye. I, I, I don't have much to lose if I get cancelled. But the facts need to be said because they're already written in books that are written by people who are much more powerful than me, sure. like Henry Ford, who wanted to so understand. This, this is not your opinion. It's stuff that's it's written fact. down in history. Okay. It's fact. Fair that enough. Jewish capital has always been able to control nations that went and, 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 and brought imperialism and slavery. They owned the ships that carried the slaves. They own the insurance houses that used to insure the slaves. They own the banks that used to give people loans on slaves. Yeah. So slaves are property. I can, I can believe that. You that's, see what I'm saying? Those, those and I, I don't think there's any Jewish person that can prove me wrong in that aspect, that the banking system that they created yeah. was founded off colonialism, well, slavery, primitive accumulation, and the discovery law that we spoke about before.
When you speak about... And my issue with Rob sure. is that he doesn't want to admit that. He makes it sound like they became rich just from genius. No, there was exploitation there. There was murder. There was genocide. There was what was done to the Jews by the uh, Nazis being done by the Jews and the powers that they funded on Africans. You're going to get our you're going to get our channel canceled right now. It shouldn't be canceled. What we should have is a discussion where we say how there do There are the, certain people that don't want us to have such discussions. How do the Jews help to correct what they did to Africa mm. or what they caused to happen to Africa mm. in the same way that they've had correction with what it is that the Nazis did to them. I've got a question but before you I ask the question I want to say this and I've had to learn over time that when you have friends, you kind of have to try and protect and defend them. Yeah. Even when your friends are wrong. Mm -hmm. I need to say that categorically. Yeah. So if I'm Cyril, if I'm Nelson Mandela and I'm friends with the Oppenheimer, with the Rupert, I almost have to protect them because maybe they affect my livelihood, our children play together, etc. This is not about Rob. And yep. Look, well, Rob is a legacy of things that have happened. I find a similar to what you're saying. Because yes, someone like him would not want to have some of those discussions. In the same way, there are certain black families whose ancestors amassed a lot of money, fortune from taxi wars, currently now maybe tender wars, political wars. And today you're third, fourth generation going to Hilton, Michael House, Bishops, St. Stithian, St. John's. And it's like, but you realize your great grandfather was, uh, it's like, hey, Baba. And it's like, you would like them to acknowledge that. And for many reasons, family reasons, they they can't. So I think I'm starting to understand why. Because you're saying your family, and I'm thinking this is a mate, therefore. The question I wanted to ask when you spoke about the slave ships and the Jewish link, um, Dutch East India Company first came to mind. Do, do you believe there was any link between, let's say, Jewish capital and the Dutch companies in terms of global economy? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, the Dutch were the richest country uh, on earth outside the Chinese and the Indians um, during the uh, Enlightenment era. And when shipping started going all across the world, they were the biggest traders. Mm. Now, of course, from America, from Western uh, history, it said that the Dutch were the richest. The truth of the matter is the Chinese were the richest and they were followed by the Indians. And then when you come to the European uh, territory, it was the Dutch. Netherlands was rich. That's why they had to travel all the way. You weren't <laughs> yeah. seeing Chinese and Indian people yeah, traveling to yeah, Europe. Yeah, so no, like, no, no, come no, to no. us. We have the wealth. And we are the greatest civilization. The world revolves around us. That was the thinking of the Chinese, which is why when people say the Chinese want to colonize the world, that's not their style. Yeah. Their style is they believe that they are an epitome of civilization and you must come to them and revolve around them. Oof. So they trade that's with you so and they trade you into submission. That's it. Can I say something quickly? Yeah. Before you carry on. Some of my mentors are very wealthy and... Uh, black, white, etc. And one of the things that's fascinated me is they generally stay at home or in their company and everyone, a president, a minister, <laughs> goes to you them. come to me and it's it's that king mindset. Yeah, You won't hear of a king going to see pe people come to the king. That's right. And I've tried to think in my head that if I ever want to be powerful, influential, I need to get into the habit of if you need something from me, come to me. And I, I guess that was the Chinese idea of we're not going to go there. We are, as you're saying, the epitome of civilization. You come to us. And, That's beautiful. And, and you raised an important point where you say sometimes you've got to protect your friends or you've got to protect people who you have an interest with. Yeah. So my only reason why I would bring up some of the things I'm bringing now sure. is that people like, her, uh, like Bob are at the forefront right now of campaigning for the DA. Sure. And he has said that he has decided to come back to reinvest in South Africa because he believes in the potential of South Africa. But more critically, there's something that he said that many people didn't listen to. He believes in South Africa because he believes that they're going to boot out the ANC and they're going to have a coalition. And what he doesn't say is that that coalition is going to be led by the DA. Okay. So where I would need to get clarity from people like Bob is that, Bob, if, if, Rob, if you're going to have the DA come back and people like you are behind the DA... Mm. Have you atoned 
for this past and the filth that we're talking about, which we don't want to associate with you per se, sure. but it's part and parcel of what it is that made you. Can we trust you and a DA that comes with you and other Jews mm. who funded the same DA under the NP government, which gave us apartheid to make people like yourselves profitable? So that's the question that we would want to ask. Mm. But it's a fair question. It's one of the things, myself, him, many other white people, many other white DA members, we debate aggressively so because we argue Pen, what do you mean? I'm like, this is not about me. My voice, my vote doesn't mean fuck all. I'm saying if you're claiming that you want black voters, you want them to understand the Democratic Alliance is great at governing, are you willing to discuss social welfare? Are you willing to discuss land? Are you willing to discuss exactly what you're saying? And, and Atonement the, and, the, and apology. And I've had them say things like, but we've apologized. And I'm like, fuck that. You're lying, number one. Number two, even if you have, it's never been sincere. And I remember one Afrikaans gentleman saying, but what are we apologizing for? It wasn't us, it was the apartheid government. I'm like, this is the problem. And this is what looks like arrogance. Because if the ANC is corrupt and some, and let's say I'm a child of whatever ANC leader. And then it's like, but you realize your father, grandfather, they ran this country to the ground. What, what do you have to, hey, it's not me. You're like, but you realize you're living in privilege mm. because off, of off fucking that. Legacy. that. Mm. And as long as specifically white people in those spaces don't want to have those conversations and they want to, but look at the ANC. I'm like, this is why you're never going to get votes. And that's why even today, and I've said this to Rob himself, I don't believe in the DA. Mm -hmm. I'm angry with the ANC. We can together stand and say, hashtag food sack ANC, but you're not going to see me campaigning for the DA mm -hmm. or any of these supposed other white leaders because I'm like a clever black. I'm a better black. I understand white people, but if you can't even convince me you don't have any idea. And I'm trying to give you a, a little window into the mindset of yeah, a absolutely. black person in an RTP in a shack somewhere. You can say, fuck the ANC and load shading, but in their heads, that versus you're not even willing to try understand. Come live with us. Come. They're never going to hear you. So I, I fully hear what you're saying. Not only that, we also have white people who are not able to introspect yeah. common sense. So... The apartheid system failed. Sure. And it failed because it took resources of 100% of the people. It taxed 100% of the people. It took the labor of 100% of the people. And then it gave services to only 10%. And that's capitalism, boy. It's capitalism, but it's also mismanagement. It is mismanagement. That's how they were removed from power by force. Yeah. When you see your own people uprising against you to remove you because you're such a bad leader, and the leadership, the bad leadership that you give is actually labeled a crime against humanity you must know that your your failure is monumental sure. what the ANC is doing will never be considered a crime against humanity the misgovernance that they supposedly say the ANC is doing is not ever going to be called a, a crime against humanity and what it is that the ANC is failing to do is a legacy of what it is that these whites did so for instance you look at the ESCOM situation mm -hmm. they created an, electric an electricity system that was created specifically to give electricity to the capitalists and the white corporates mm. so that they can mine better, they can industrialize and produce better, mm. and they can make money. Then they decided to give their proxies or their caretakers and their gatekeepers, the white population, the very same electricity. Mm. But this money that was used to create this was from the exploitation of the resources of this country called South Africa mm. that they didn't own. So they are stolen resources from black South Africans. They used that to build ESCOM. Mm. They also used the labor of these black people they also didn't pay these people adequate salaries. These people would be paid 10% uh, uh, of what they're supposed to be paid and the other 90% would be used to subsidize whites so that they can have more money. Sure. But the whites were still paying the cheapest electricity in the world, which means they were not paying a fair value for that electricity and they were not paying for replacement cost of this electricity. And that's why ESCOM is where it is, is because the depreciation, mm -hmm. the money to make sure that this ESCOM can be maintained and this ESCOM can be replaced and its machines can be replaced wasn't paid by white South Africans. So they were freeloading of this uh, 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 social welfare system of apartheid that allowed them to have cheap electricity, allowed them to have cheap maids, allowed them to have uh, uh, job preservation and allowed them to have more salaries and higher salaries than they should have deserved mm -hmm. at the expense of black people. And now that black people have to be put on that grid of the same electricity they built, the same electricity built by their stolen resources. 
they are now being told that they should pay for their electricity, yet they've been paying for the past 60 years since the establishment of ESCOM. Mm. They've been playing with their blood, they've been paying with their labor, they've been paying with their low salaries. Mm. The reason you've got black tax today, you have to look after your grandmother, grandfather, you have to look after those relatives of yours that are sick from lung diseases caused by working in mines is because the money that was supposed to be paid your grandfather, the pension that was supposed to be paid your grandfather has been taken and put into the pockets of all white South Africans who are sitting with unjust enrichment that came from a period of exploitation. And then they want to blame ESCOM's failures on the ANC. ANC should have a large kitty, huge savings, like the 380 billion I'm saying is sitting in white corporations. And I'm not even talking about what they've externalized. The ANC should have a kitty like that for all the parastatals if white South Africans had been paying the full value and full fee for what it is that they were using as services and if the services were going to make them pay replacement costs for those things. They mm. didn't. Politics is emotional. Um, <laughs> back to the Dutch and you were speaking about China yeah. and I was asking if there's a link between what you were saying was Jewish global capital and industry um, and any link to the Dutch or the Afrikaners maybe Very here good. <laughs> and I think maybe for this episode we'll probably end just before the Afrikaners take over from the British in the South African economy and then we'll carry on with the next chat right so it's like I so was saying that the Dutch were very innovative people. Mm. And maybe, and when, when you speak, when you read people like Lord Rob Stadet's book, um, he, he says that they were Nordics, Aryans, the superior white race. Yeah. That's why they've got so much creativity. That's why they're so inventive. Mm. That's why they're so productive. So they were inventors. They produced things like the ship campus. They produced things like ships, high quality ships. Mm. They produce things like the sale. They produce the accounting system, the banking system, the first stock exchanges in the world. And that's how they got connected with the Jews. I'm trying to figure out, is the Netherlands any close to Egypt and those nope. areas? No, it's actually... Because deep. some people would argue that these are African inventions, accounting, you mentioned accounting and other things. Right. When Sorry, we, I didn't want to deviate. I and, and I like what you bring up, but I don't want us to be caught up in the old system that was led by Africa. I want to talk about the new era Fair that enough. comes after the enlightenment Un of the European. Yeah. Understandable. So, so, so within this new era of the enlightenment of the European, where they start dominating the world, soon after we get out of the, uh, uh, what you call it, the Crusades, from the Crusades we get into the enlightenment, the creation of the printing press, and then mm. so forth and so on. The Dutch... Gut Gutenberg. <laughs> yes. Fuck, I'm so and, smart. And people don't understand that these were the markers for the development of Western civilization that has been prevailing for the past 700 years. Mm. But within so doing, it's also destroying the world faster than any other era before. Sure. So this is where the Dutch and their creativity, the ability to produce and innovate technologies that became cutting edge, the ship became cutting edge, the campus became cutting edge, the sails of the ships became cutting edge, their ability to turn ship's wool that was coming from places like Spain and places like England and sophisticating them into sails for ships mm made them very wealthy. And this is where they say that Spain used to be a very rich country. Portugal used to be very rich countries. They used to extract a lot of wealth from South America, but they lost all that wealth because when they came back to Europe with all their gold and all their silver, they had to spend it in the Netherlands, mm. buying ships, buying campuses, buying sails. Mm. And the Netherlands then began to sell what it sophisticated from what they were producing, the sheepskin, the sheep wool that they were producing, mm. they would make it they will produce it into value that is 10 times, 100 times more. And that's how they got wealth from Spain, from Spain and Portugal. Mm. The British were falling in the same trap. Mm. They were having to buy cloth. They were having to buy produced products. And then Henry came up with the Tudor plan and said, whoa, we're actually becoming a third world country in Europe or the Netherlands, uh, Florence and France are progressing. Florence is Italy. Yes. Okay. The only reason he knew that is that he was raised by his auntie, which is that link against sex Coburgs and royal families linked in Europe. Mm -hmm. He was raised in France. And when he saw what the French were doing, making cloth, making silk, making, he realized the importance of England get catching up. So when he became president, he came up with a plan called the Tudor plan. He said, we will not sell our wool anymore. 
to the Dutch mm. or to the uh, 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 to the French. to the French. We are going to ask Dutch companies if they want our wool to come and produce the wool in our country. Hey, Zimbabwe is saying, come have your lithium <laughs> companies here. That's why you have to read history. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? My because brother what, wants it. Because what, what you're trying to get is what they call the triple rent. Sure. The triple rent comes in controlling the resource, a manufacturing the resource or processing the resource into a finished manufactured good, mm -hmm. and then controlling the market. And guess what we said about the Oppenheimers? We were able to show that they earned the triple rent. Mm. They control the gold under the ground. Yes. Then they process the gold through Jason Mathy or Engelhardt Industries in America mm. or Bassef. Then they take it to market, which they control, mm. to the London bullion market. My brother says uh, history is a blueprint for life. It's a blueprint? Not blueprint, what? A memorandum. Mm. When you're writing an exam. That's right. If you go and study history, you've already got all the answers. When you hear a politician, you're like, oh, I've seen this exam paper. As a strategist, you always say research is the most important thing for you to create a strategy. So creating the strategy, positioning, mm. and everything else is only 20%. Your research forms about 80%. Sure. And people don't understand that research is a history. Mm. And Africans hate history. We've taken it out of the curriculum. Mm. But yet it's 80% of a strategy. So then it's 80% of what it is that builds a person's ability to innovate. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And this is what we are losing out. And we need not lose out on this. Because everything we're talking about here, we keep giving examples of people who learned from history, implemented history, and they were able to do. And we have also proved that by our ANC government and ZANU-PF governments not using history, yeah. ZANU-PF didn't look at Kwame Nkrumah and how they sabotaged uh, Kwame Nkrumah, how they sabotaged his Volta project mm. and how they eventually got him removed from power because they didn't study Kwame Nkrumah. Sure. The ANC has not studied ZANU-PF yeah. to understand what did they do when you reconciled with the whites? What happened? Sure. We haven't studied how the Dutch made it how the Dutch and the Jews became related. So this innovation, mm. this ability to control commerce, that the, the Jews were able to say, these Dutch are clever. Yeah. But you also have to understand a lot of the Dutch in there are also have got Jewish blood. Okay. Are also Jews who migrated from Germany, France, and influenced the creative spirit within uh, the Netherlands. Netherlands. But... When we now look at how they then meet here in South Africa, Japanese Victor, I mean, uh, 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 the VOC. The VOC uh, comes from the Netherlands or the Dutch East India Company comes from the Netherlands, starts circumventing uh, Africa, coming to the bottom of Africa, and then they settle here at the filling point that's here in South Africa. Mm. When they settle here, there's the Khoi that are here, the Dutch, the, the, the Portuguese have already been here. So they create a city that was mainly based on trading water, wood, and food. Mm. And when they, were, when they created this, this thing was controlled by a guy called Ashmola, Ash, Ashmao, who was a, 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 a koi. Ashmao. Yeah. Okay. He actually had a daughter, and a son, who had to be trained in Java by the, by the Dutch, who took them there, showed them how it is that trade is done with the Europeans so that they can better the port mm. of Cape Town. And he came back and started running that port. Do you know if the term company comes from the Dutch? You spoke I'm about not, accounting. I'm not sure. Okay. But I might have heard something like that. Like even the, the conceptualization of what a company is today yes. may come from those Dutch East India but company you, things. But anyways. You will see that even till today, most of your corporations in South Africa, so SAB, mm. which was also controlled by owned, basically controlled by the uh, Oppenheimers and Anglo-American. Anglo -American, you're right. But all of its intellectual property was not held in South Africa. It was held in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Hmm. So Castle Lager, eh, Lyon, eh, what, 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 what's the other one? Black Label. Black Label. Belgium, oh. sorry, Mark Rich. Mark Rich, I think is from Belgium, but he's Jewish. Belgian, Belgian Jewish person. Mark Rich from... The, Glen the guy who gave birth to Glenco. Yes, Glenco. Sorry. So you'd be surprised that all of SAB's products mm. were registered and trademarked and they're pr 
intellectual property held in Belgium and the Netherlands. That means the money flows there because you have to pay the IP owners. Exactly. Exactly. So you call it a South African company. It's not. And that's why right now it's been sold. It's now part and parcel of uh, AB InBev. Hmm. AB InBev was what? Belgian? <laughs> if you go and look at the capital behind AB InBev, you're still going to see it tying back to that combine I told you about. You're going to see that the investors in there are BlackRock. Hmm. You're going to see Fidelity, Vanguard or State Street. You know, speak about IP. I don't know if it's Andrew Tate who was mentioning something about this setup that it still happens today. Because I mean, Nike sweatshops in China, and you're like, the Chinese are making everything, and they might from China not go back to America. They distribute to wherever the Nikes need to be sold, but the bulk of the money needs to go to America because that's where the IP is held. That's why the IP is held because a, a pair of Nikes can be manufactured for ninety nine dollars. But the same pair of Nikes is going to sell for 120 sometimes $200. $9 is what it costs to produce it. To transport it to the United States is another probably a dollar each. Mm. So where does the rest of this value go to? It's because of the intellectual property. The intellectual property, the marketing costs, mm. the brand. That's where the value is. Sure. And all those do not reside in China or the places where the production is, ta is taking place. Mm. SAB's value was being extracted in South Africa. It made alcoholics of Africans. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the profits are in the Netherlands. And when, they f when it suited Anglo-America, they simply sold it off to a European company that has no association with South Africa. So South Africa can't even take claim of SAB. Yet SAB was created by the blood, sweat, and enslavement of uh, 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 South Africans. But, Tony, and, can we, can but we let's look at the... Sorry, if you can please wrap it up here because I think we can keep going and I'm scared. Agreed. Please, no, 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 please carry on with the SAP, Ashmao. I don't know if you want to finish off that. Right. So, so But then so, you want to owe me again. Very good. So sure. so with people Must like... owe me, Baba. I'm a Rothschild. I'm here <laughs> to collect my debt. <laughs> with people like Ashmao, and before Ashmao, there was another gentleman. I've just forgotten his name. Um, um, they began to run the port. Yeah. And in fact, Ashmao at some point became the governor of the Cape. He was the, 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 the what they call the port master mm. of the Cape port. So the Cape port was not established by white people per se. It was established by the Khoi. Mm. It was established by Africans. Yeah. But over time, the Dutch came in, they realized this guy's making money. Yeah. He sells livestock, he sells water. Water was very important. Because mm -hmm. you can't drink seawater. Yes, you can't drink seawater. Yeah. And the food that they were growing. And these were being grown by the peripheral Khoi and the San communities and the Kosa communities were the ones that were growing this food mm -hmm. that would be brought to port. So the very first thing that uh, uh, Jan van Riebeek does is once they've created a relationship within 10 years, they then start chasing away the Khoi from the mouth of the river so that they can start controlling the river mm. and fresh water. Mm. They then build a fort around it. And then they needed cows from the natives, from the, the, the koi, from the san, and from uh, uh, the, the Kosa community. They started sending their people out to raid. They tried to buy. Ashmao had already had relationships with all the uh, natives in the area, so he started refusing them to sell the cows to the Dutch. He would do the selling. Mm. And when he sold the cows to the Dutch, he would sell and say five or three, five sheep, one cow, and so forth. Mm. So the Dutch never had enough to put on their ships. They would have to then rely, and the English would have to rely on Ashmao. And Ashmao himself had a relationship with the English. The Dutch started seeing this as a problem. Mm. The first guy that was there, I'm just forgetting his name, they killed him. Mm. The Dutch. Ashmao, they were trying to kill him. Eventually, they arrested him and put him onto Robin Island because he killed one of the shepherds of the Dutch and took back the cows that they had stolen. Mm. So this is where you start seeing a coalescing of the Dutch, of the of the of the we, 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 the Dutch coming in and beginning to control South Africa. Mm -hmm. And as they begin to control South Africa, as it becomes more important as a filling point, the Jews are also coming in with an interest. Mm. But I also want us to stop the danger of separating the Jews and the Dutch because some Dutch 
A lot of Dutch are Jew- Jewish, were Jewish. people as well. Just like a lot of Germans were Jewish people, a lot of Russians are Jewish people, a lot of Americans are Jewish people, mm. a lot of Britons are Jewish people. But the, po- the point is, we're dealing with people that are very powerful. We still have a lot to unpack, but thank you so much for coming through today. The political education, the emphasis on, hi- we need to study history and not only study it, we need to implement it. Because you might find the ANC does know of Zisco and you're like, but you guys don't even implement. have a similar plan to, to implement and ward off certain things. Um, I think I urge everyone who's going to be listening here to study Anglo-American as f- deeply as possible. Because later on, we speak about the links it has to black economic empowerment and yes. some of our current political leaders. Um, I know I wanted you to break down who owns South Africa. And it means everything to me that you're giving a full context and background so that by the time we get to the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the Ruperts and Oppenheimers, people can completely link all the dots and how we connect to the global economy and why, especially for young black kids who are passionate about the land and the economy, why the fight is so complicated, so layered, etc. Because one of the things I wanted to say earlier was we get the land back, we have the minerals back, but if the so-called Rothschilds, we still have to sell the gold, the platinum, yeah. the silver yeah. to them. Yeah. If they still have to price us, if they still, we're still sitting ducks. And for me, part of these conversations and the work I do is very much about trying to unplug people from the current psychological hold they have, plug them into a new frequency. Because once you get into that frequency, money no longer holds value. Even things like gold no longer hold value. Debt holds no value. And you go back to nature, land, real resources, animals, and you own yourself and you become the god of your life. And the only way they can stop you, which they do do, is through death and then starting a new psychological plan of how to get you to plug into their systems, which keep them rich and keep you and your people poor. And you know, I like what you said, because as Africans, we need to get to a point where sometimes we decide that give me freedom or give me death. Mm. The problem is we want to live even under bondage. Yeah, we gotta be. We gotta stop being afraid of dying, and be prepared to be killed for what is ours and principle, in order for us to live better lives or to die better. And then, uh, lastly, I want to say this: I hope one thing that is happening between you and me is that we we understand that sometimes we gotta make enemies. I mean, we gotta make friends even with our enemies for the greater good yeah. or for the greater collective good. Yeah. So we might, like now, we are in a team and in this team we've got people we detest. Yeah. Some people detest the ANC, but we have to keep the team together and sometimes we're going to have to support a team player that we don't like for the sake of the team. And I'll give you a perfect example. So I say to you that I would stop speaking about uh, Kagame if I got an instruction yeah. from home. And what is interesting is I got a phone call from home. And the phone this call was... This is a real thing? Oh, yes, it's a real thing. From certain leaders there? From the, from the top. Jesus. Let's put it like that. Okay. And they said, listen, you need to understand this. We appreciate the work that you do. You talk about Zimbabwe. You're growing Zimbabwe. But understand that Kagame is a strategic ally right now. Mm. A very important ally. And because he is an important ally, we would like to ask for you to tone down sure. on the criticism. Sure. You know how I feel about Kagame. Mm. But if my country feels that it is a strategic alliance with Kagame that they have to protect, yeah. I have to stop what I'm doing because I'm a team player. Mm. For the greater good. For the greater good. Yeah. And hopefully, my government can also start talking to their ally mm. to say, for us to build an Africa, Africa is the team, can you start changing things here, 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 here? Sure. And if Kagame listens, then we have a better African team that can play better. Yeah. So I will stop attacking Kagame yeah. for the benefit and the sake of the team, the smaller team, with the hope that the smaller team and Kagame can help us to build the bigger team. You and I are becoming, not politicians, but we, we're moving up to the highest levels of power and influence. And unfortunately, these become some of the compromises. It's a beautiful thing, but as long as, to what you were saying when you quoted Andile Mnitama, as long as we keep our eye on the fundamental struggle and we keep fighting for that and not the petty struggles, absolutely, I think we want to get somewhere. Yep. Rutendo, thank you so much. We've got to stop being about ego and we've got to make it about the greater, the, the greater good. Boom. Cheers, man.